and welcome to the Paper Sec Podcast. I am Brett Burke and this is Brick Allen. And uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to 2023. Yes. It's... Goodbye, 2022. That's right. Exit stage left. <laughs> so, yeah, we're finally here. And so it's January or February when we're watching this. But, uh, yeah, so you had a great New Year's? New Year's was good. It was, man, this was like that New Year's where I was like, I don't, I don't know if it's because I'm older, getting older. And I was like, I don't want to. I don't either. I went to neighbors' houses. That's. I was like, it's twelve o'clock. By the time we get kissed, we're good. All right, bye. I'm out. I had fun. Don't get me wrong, but I had. I had we had like three parties that we needed to go to. Mm-hmm. Two of them were thirty-five to forty-five minutes away from the house, and so I was like, okay. I was like, I'm not. I'm not drinking and driving. So I was no. like, I'm just gonna be. So I drank water, um, a lot of water. Got my hydration in for the day, and. I did too. It's called Course Light. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went out and then worked our way back, and then we got back to the house mm-hmm. by like 11 30, 11 40. And so then I had, you know, had an adult beverage and uh, enjoyed, you know, the New Year coming in. But I was just like, ah, I just don't really feel like doing that. You know, by 12 30, I was in bed. Yeah, me too. I walked the kids home as soon as 12 was over. And we walked home, and that was it. Oh. We went up to our hunting camp uh, in between Christmas and New Year's, and um, it's in the panhandle of Florida, so, you know, we go up there, hunt, kids have fun, we got campers and stuff, we got a well, so we got running water, bathroom, well, it's, it got so cold, it was below, it was in the 20s, the low 20s for like 20, You're saying that in some of our audience 20 hours. in Canada. <laughs> oh yeah, I know, but, but it was in the 20s for like 20 hours, mm. so the pipes all froze, the well froze, it burst. Oh, so we got there in like the first two days. It was like we, well, the first two days we couldn't do anything, even work on it because everything was still frozen. It wasn't until day three when it got up into the fifties that everything thawed out and we could start working on it. So it was, uh, it was an interesting time in the woods with no running water. I can imagine that it was it was terrible. But usually in the woods you don't have any running water. <laughs> we we do. We have a cook shed that we've built, and we've got you know campers and we've got running water and outdoor showers and wow it's awesome the, it's uh, we have an inst- yeah it is we have an insta hot which you, you hook it up to propane and you just turn it on and get hot water right away and it's fantastic because you know when it's in your 50s you can you know normally take showers at night after you've been doing you know working all day or doing whatever and it's just you're under the stars taking a hot shower it's just awesome that's pretty cool it is but <coughs> there was none of that while we were there but it was you know wasn't too much sweating because it was in the you know high 20s low 30s oof yeah that's not, that's not what do you got for us today so the question arose someone's on the site and they're they wanted to know they're like look i want to buy my first note um i'm looking at a mortgage note right now and i'm looking at a cfd i'm, I'm looking at a land note what's the differences in cost for due diligence versus you know land for mortgage note and what are the differences or do I need to get a different document when I'm on a land note or do I need to get a different document on a CFD to a, a, a mortgage what's the what's the due diligence differences like wh- what do I know if I'm like okay this set of tools for land this set of tools for CFD and this for mortgage and deed of trust or is that not the case So, it's a little bit different. If it's just strictly a land note, if it's a land note in Florida, it could still be a mortgage. So, you got to look at it and say, okay, don't decipher the difference of if if it's a contract for deed, because you could have a contract for deed on vacant land. You could have a mortgage on vacant land. You could have a deed of trust on vacant land. Okay. Right? So, you need to look at it and say, okay, really, it's what's the underlying collateral. Is it, is it a piece of vacant land? Is there a, a single family house on there? Is there a duplex on there? What, what's going on? Okay. So I think we've, we've kind of gone into the differences between contract for deeds and mortgages or deeds of trust of, of do, running due diligence. Right, we, I think we've covered that. We, we've covered that. So let's just talk about like, look, single family home uh, versus vacant land versus maybe vacant ha- land with a, uh, a trailer, a mobile home on it. Right? Vacant land with a hot shower on it. <coughs> vacant land with a hot shower on it, yeah. <laughs> vacant land with um, that stuff. So it, there is some differences, right, in the due diligence that you're going to look at. Um, one of them is because on what you're going to find, I think, is the biggest thing is value. 
like the value of the underlying collateral. So whether it's the vacant land or whether it's the land in the house, right? Because if it's a land in a house, that's pretty straightforward. You can go out half a mile or a mile, or if you're in a rural area, you go out however far it is to kind of find a similar or comparable house. Oh, wow, well, I can that, see how that could be really hard to find. With land, you can, you can run into something really, really easy. And you're like, oh, this is so easy. There's a comp. This one next door sold for this. Let me give you an example. Maybe somebody bought a 20-acre plot or a 30-acre plot, mm -hmm. and they threw some roads in there, mm -hmm. right? And they, and they chopped it up into one-acre parcels, so maybe you got 25 one-acre lots that they're selling, mm -hmm. right? And they sell them all for the same thing. Mm -hmm. And they're taking owner financing in, and they're collecting, you know, six grand down, and they got this. Well, there's your you, you like if you're buying one of those lots, you've got twenty four other comps, right? But how good are those comps, really? Because it's all like it's all concentrated in the same neighborhood on somebody who's doing owner financing. Mm -hmm. You don't really know what the underwriting was like to get those loans done. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So doing the land is a little bit more difficult. Value more difficult? Oh yeah, evaluating land is more difficult as far as getting the value. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't think that was the case. Why? Well, I don't know. I just thought it was. <laughs> well, it's so, it's so. Um, the reason why is because you can be over. You can oversell the land, okay. right? So. Land in the area might go for twelve thousand an acre. It's we'll just, yeah, we'll just say twelve grand an acre, and you're selling it for thirty six thousand an acre with six thousand down, right? So if you go to do the comparables, you're like, well, this is there's twenty loans, there's twenty lots here at thirty six thousand an acre. Well, it's thirty six thousand an acre because you sold it to people who could put down six thousand dollars and they want that land. Does that mean that's the value of the land? I don't know. Is it? If nobody else outside of that neighborhood is able to sell a one acre parcel for 36,000 to somebody cash, what does that mean for the values over here? So, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the land is, is that's not the value of the land because it, it very well could be, right? right? Because that's what somebody was willing to pay if they could have credit extended to them. But usually what happens is you're buying it for $6,000 an acre and selling it for $36,000 an acre. And you're, there's a huge markup there. Oh, when you're buying it. Yeah, when you're doing the one buying And so what yeah. I'm saying is, whenever you're buying it and slicing it up, it's really hard to put peg the value on, on land. Versus houses is much, much easier because banks are lending on houses. There's a lot more people needing a place to actually live. So with three, two, 1200 square feet, there's a good chance if it's not in a rural area, I'm going to be able to pin down a value pretty simple. I can go look a half a mile, mile okay. out. So it's easier to run your values on that. Um, Which is but, but land can be just very subjective. It can be like, well, what's the value in the land? What's the value of the dirt? Like if you're selling, if you're buying a loan that's got um, an actual physical house on there, well, usually the actual physical property makes up a majority, usually, of the value. <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. Like land value is usually less than house value. Now there's some stuff, you know, we can get into it and say, you know, obviously some of the, the, the land values in Windermere that have the older houses on there, you yeah, know, yeah. Windermere's a nicer, you, you can, you see what I'm saying? So that's one thing that I find, I think is a little more difficult is, is establishing actual value of the of the dirt and be right. like because at the end of the day i'm always worried about what do i have to do if i have to take this back yeah and so for that process too i thought and this is just me not knowing but i figured you know worst case scenario you have to take the land back uh well, actually we had it happen on our site someone actually did this same thing and i told them to do this and so they had to take the land back usually when it's a land <coughs> thing unless they're living on it uh they might just have you know a, a camper with a cook shed and hot shower on it and some running water mm -hmm. and then they, or maybe not even all that but it's not the primary residency so if you know something bad happens and god forbid you know they're in a tough spot 
and they're not paying for it, there's a higher chance that you could just go to that person and say, look, you know, I, I know you're in a tough spot. Look, I don't want you to have a foreclosure on your record. Why don't you just deed this over to me and you can walk away and call it a day. Cool? Yeah. And a lot of people, most times they're like, no foreclosure, another thing off my plate, don't have to worry about this. Here's a deed, whatever, we had fun, we did. And then yeah, they walk exactly. away. And then at that point, the, exactly what happened is the guy, I said, you know, I said, get it back and get it back and go to these land listing sites, which was like, 50 of them. You just go to these sites. Resell with, it. Resell it. Put it for <coughs> owner financing as soon as you do. Put, you know, take something, season it for a couple months, and then come back to the site and list it. And, and sell it. And yeah. he did. So for me, I was like, well, I thought that the process of loss mitigation would be extremely faster. I might be totally wrong. But I mean, I'll imagine it somebody is, would fight for their house a lot more than they would fight some land out in the middle of the woods. They would. They would. But if they've got, if like, what if they've drilled a well? What if they're, you know, they've got a camper or a mobile home on there? Now they've got something it's there. Mobile. So, what, well, which, which also starts to come to, like when you're doing research, or when you're doing your due diligence on what's vacant land and it's got a mobile home on there, you have to like figure out: does is a mobile home included in the mortgage? Is it secured by that mortgage, or is the mortgage secured by that mobile home? Right. So, if you have to foreclose, are you entitled to the mobile home? Mm. Right, there's a lot of different things on there, or is it just the land? So would um, you would find that in the contract, though, right? If there's a mobile home, yeah, you would. That would be in the mortgage. You would be able to look in the mortgage and, and kind of see. Okay. Um, it would. It should mention it. it Shouldn't talk about title or there's affidavits that can sign um, affixing it to the mortgage. Um, so those, yeah, those are those are the important things I think when you're looking at. It vacant land versus single family is, hey, what's going on? Right, so I, that's interesting, yeah, because I guess if you're always looking at value, that's important. Um, the thing that I would also see too, at least with a lot of this land sellers, a title, that's another one. What if there's a mobile home, is, the, is there a title to it? Yeah, it's true. Because if you're foreclosing and that's included with it or it is affixed to the mortgage, you really have to find where's the title. Mm. And you can go through the DMV, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to track down a title. You, you go through the DMV, yeah. Oh yeah, oh, well, oh yeah, and I, I only learned that because I did a deal with First National, and they're like, do you have title for this? And I was like, no, they're like, Ugh. well can you try to get it? And I was like, I don't know even where to begin. She's like, I'll just call the DMV. And she called the DMV and she had it in like a day. I'm like, I'm learning something new every day. <laughs> yeah. DMV would have been not my first guess. No, that was like, that was not, I, did, I, was, I was, didn't even know where to start. And, uh, well, Rachel Sims over there at uh, yeah. First first National pointed me in the right direction, so she was great. So it's, what are a couple of the other things that, where <clears throat> I kind of like looked at the land and I said, you know, I think maybe it was an easier entry point a lot of times is because, and I might be totally wrong again, so a lot of times with the mortgages and deeds of trust, whatever, it's done with houses. If they have like legacy assets, you you have to verify the chain. There can be a lot more chances for stuff to be screwed up. Sure. But with the land note, a lot of times these land investors, they sold this thing like a year ago. And they're, they're, they held it for a little bit. It's their original lender, and that person. So you're talking when you're when you're buying it. You're talking to the original lender. Like yeah. that person's like, yeah, I know. You know Sue and Joe. I I sold that, it to them. That definitely um, that makes it easier for for tracking the chain of title, as long as they've, they've dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's. And one of the things also that I found is the land guy, uh, not saying all land guys, but sometimes it's not uncommon for them to not use a professional servicer. And so you, you're, you're looking down the barrel of, okay, I've got these loans uh, that I'm buying, these land notes that are great. Most of the time, the nice thing about land notes is they're like, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, I've seen 13% interest some, rates. There's going to be some coming that are 12.9. 12.9%. They're super steep, but they may not have they may not have professional servicing in place. Or they may not have uh, origination docs. You know, sometimes it's like a, a one-page contract. Here, sign it, shake my hand. They gave me $6,000 down, you know. They gave me fifty hundred dollar bills and, and you know and the closing was at Chili's. Yeah, <laughs> for real. That's yeah, yeah. I'm not joking. It was, yeah, the closing at Chili's. You sign it, you have a beer, and you guys go around your happy way. And that's it. And yeah. so there's you know there's there's a deal that we um, we helped broker that was a big deal, a land deal. You know, it was like six point eight million, mm -hmm. and 
a hundred and hundred and eight loans. Yeah. And they had to go back and redo every single mortgage and every single deed because the way it was, it was just like it wasn't done right the first time. Mm -hmm. And so there's That's usually what I find is the land stuff, there's higher interest rates, higher returns, a little more risk on, hey, did they actually do the documents? And don't get me wrong, there's a group I know about of Austin that they are turning and burning these things. I mean, they are buying up 100 acre plots and then they're they're getting them all in chopping them up selling them they're they're originating these loans to look smell taste and feel just like yeah, a, those are some good ones those are good loans 11.9 percent mm -hmm. um but they also you know they want 87 to 93 percent depending on how long they've been seasoned for so i mean can you argue with that i mean no you can't they're doing I mean, they're doing a good job because right income stream at that point so yeah you are so but you know you got to look at then there's the other the other side of the equation where you got people who are closing at Chili's with a one page contract and you know, I mean a lot of times, well, some people that just have digital docs they're like do I have to send something to the auditor because literally you want me to print it off my computer and then send it to them like, it's all digital and it's, it's all digital it's yeah like, so just okay as long as the buyer's cool with it and we're cool with it the other thing too is the shorter terms they're usually shorter terms I think five yeah, years five years and they're a lot of times they're lower balance that's that's those are some of the nice things about the early entry or the the low entry point you can buy them for five six seven thousand dollars you can kind of get uh, the process down 12, you know have a have a 12 percent income stream that's got five years I mean come on who doesn't like that that's, I mean, that's just simple. <clears throat> and then the other thing, too, a lot of times, at least I'm seeing it now, this wasn't the case before. You know, I, I've told one of the, our big sellers, like, he's like, look, you know, when we sell these things, it's, it, gets, it gets funky and da da da, -da or, or the servicing part. And I, I just said, why don't you just make it a part of your negotiation, servicing was retained with the, the seller. I was like, you, you keep that small little bit of income, but they have the assurance that. Nothing, this stuff's not getting messed up. Like that person just keeps paying that same servicer, and that person just changes where the wire goes. Goes to this guy now instead of going to this guy. Mm -hmm. You know that's something because yeah, that if you're if you're only making what did you say like three or four hundred bucks or two hundred bucks a month, and your servicing fee is twenty dollars, jeez, that's, that's a lot. You know, like, right. you know, over long, you know, over five years, can they kind of take a lot of your money. You know, right? To collect the check, so it's like if you can keep it with them, usually they don't. It's a, it's a way lower because they're not even. Usually paying, I've seen it like at eight dollars. Yeah, some also some of the things I've seen is uh, that group out of Austin, um, borrowers pay all the servicing costs. Really? Yeah, it's like wow. Borrowers pay fifteen or twenty bucks a month for servicing costs. Wow. Loan servicing, which I thought was fantastic. So <laughs> it's fantastic. So I don't know. I think that's it. Um, I think I you answered a lot of it. I did. Values. I did. There wasn't. Yeah, values. I mean, I, I like to usually have bullet points, so it's like here, this, this, and this. But this, that was kind of a lot. But values are a little tougher. You got really have to look into them. And values on vacant land, subjective title for if there's a mobile home, is the mobile home fixed, and uh, does the mobile home secure the mortgage? Is Check the DMV. The DMV. Uh, DMV, yeah. And so, you know, and then look at the origination docs and make sure, have somebody look at it and make sure everything was originated properly and it's in good working order, so. A twist question. When you, when you do the DMV, do you have to do the county DMV or is it like a state? How does DMV is like a statewide? I don't know. Don't ask me that. I told you. I don't know. I, didn't, I didn't dive in. She said I found it at the DMV. I'm like, 10-4. I got other things to worry about. That's like, it. you're you handling it? Look, I don't go ask my surgeon. Like, do you lift up on the stomach and then go to the intestines? Or the intestines you pull those? I don't know. You just fix it, man. Yeah, I got you. Doc, just fix me. I got you. All so. right, well, cool. Well, if you guys got your own questions, of course, you know what to do. Put them in the comments here. If you're interested in learning more education, we got the Academy which uh, is probably rolling a video right now that you can see. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having another bunch of success with these uh, videos. If we can just keep coming up with awesome questions that come from our audience and we'll keep making them. So uh, yeah, happy 2023. We'll see you in the next one.